example. And suppose Zoltan wants to know, you know, what time it is. Okay. So if Zoltan walked into say business time and asked, how much the dictionary did I tell you from time? It's right in front of you. You see this box here. That's built by my nephew, not the smartest boy. Well, it says 33 minutes past the hour. Is that right? Of course it's right. However, if Zoltan, instead of going into the tavern, had he gone at the exact same moment into the bank building, how can I show you, sir? I want you to show me the time. Three minutes past the hour. Is it right, though? Yes, it's right. Or, at that very same moment, suppose instead of going to the tavern of the bank, he'd go to the hotel. Can I tell you? Can you tell me the time? Yes, of course. My, my timepiece has... Yeah, oh, it, is that silver? It's for the style, actually. It's 19 past the hour. So at the tavern, it's 33 past the hour at the hotel, 19 past the bank, three past the time. Is it really in Sandusky? That's the question. The answer is... There was no official time in Sandusky. Huh? What do you mean there was no official time in Sandusky? There wasn't any, not in 1850. The government didn't have a time. Really? All there were, were clocks. So in Ohio, in the 1850s, you'd have as many times as there were clocks in the town. Huh. So there was no reason you know, to <coughs> synchronize. If, if your clock and my clock were four minutes or ten minutes different in Sandusky in the 1850s, who cares? Until... The railroad changed everything. Once the railroad came in, it's also I wanted to take, I don't know, how about the uh, 303 Cleveland? Okay. If you wanted to take the 303 Cleveland, how would you know when it was 303? Oh, I see where you're going. If he went by the bank's clock, he'd arrive a half hour in the clock. If he went by the hotel's clock, he'd arrive in the nick of time. Oh, wait, wait, wait. And if he went by the tavern's clock, oh, no.
good question, because they have no way of knowing because horses move faster than eyeballs can see. So Leland Stanford wanted to prove that a horse had all four feet off the ground at one time, and he was recommended to try Moybridge as a photographer to capture this. And along comes Edward Moybridge, the photographer. He could take a picture of the horse at exactly the right instant. He could see whether all four feet were off the ground and solve the bet. Here's the problem. Cameras in those days were very slow. A fast exposure would be maybe a second or several seconds. Moybridge was going to push photography to suddenly be able to capture motion in a 500th of a second. Otherwise, you just got blur. Imagine that first step out of the world of blur. Moybridge had stretched a wire across the racetrack and attached it to the shutter mechanism on his camera. Oxygen the horse gallops by, trips the wire, which freezes the horse mid gallop, steals him right out of the flow of time. Except Moybridge doesn't just take one photo, he takes 24. So you place 24 cameras in a line, <clears throat> one after the other, with 24 trip wires stretching across the racetrack. The horse tripped every one. Four frozen, unblurry, running horses. So what, what did they see? Well, the pictures formed a series of a horse running. Some of those photos showed oxen, yes, with all four feet off the ground. So the camera here unlocks a secret. It, it lets us see something you could never see before because this camera it essentially it stops time. Exactly. Meanwhile, says Rebecca Moybridge became fascinated with learning more secrets of time. Secrets locked inside basic human movements. No leap. A splash, a walk, a pirouette. Wow, one mm -hmm. day. But they're so enchanted when you really pay attention to them. Yeah. Moybridge had photographed Russian water. He was obsessed with water in his landscape picture. So he obsessively has people pour water, splash water, pour water over themselves, pour pictures of water, pour water into glasses, splash water out of basins, bathe in water. And you can see all these droplets frozen in midair. There's one particular photo, Robert, where you see a sheet of water suspended in the air, hovering over the splasher. Kind of like a ghost. Anyhow, take all those frozen moments and line them one after the other and play them back, and you've got flow again. Albeit artificial flow, which we call movies. Movies are good. Yes, yeah. But the next time you're feeling stressed out, you say to yourself, I'm stressed. I need to go to a movie to relax. Well, you should know that the technology that made the movies is exactly the thing which sped up the pace of modern life, which stressed you out, which led you to go to movies. Uh, I don't know. What does that mean? What do you mean with that? Well, one of the first ways movies were used was to film factory workers doing repetitive tasks and then find out how to make those tasks more efficient. So if I were pushing the levers uh, maybe too slowly, is this right? They would find the guy who did it the right way, film him, slow the film down, and use that to teach everyone else. And then when World War II came, this was not just now the cause of efficiency. This was a life or death matter because this is how you beat Nazis. All the scientific devices of chronology are machines manufacturing time. The tools that in our hands mean victory. And our hands must be as relentless as the hands of our clock. <clears throat> There's a whole other way to think about this. Time can be a weapon in battle, or it can be the most sensuous and subtle and natural thing in the world. I learned about this from a book by Jay Griffiths called The Sideways Look at Time. Let me just take a stop here at clocks, even though you don't like clocks, because there's so many cool clocks in your book. <laughs> oh, cool. First of all, there's a spice clock. Yes, we use the clocks, which you can see when it's really dark, and it's, you, know, you can see that you've just woken up at 2.35, and you really didn't want to wake up at 2.35. But of course, for a long time, you know, in the night, you don't have a way of seeing um, what the time is, and so somebody invented a spice clock so you could taste your way through the night. So there would be maybe kind of, you know, cinnamon for about one o'clock and turmeric for two o'clock. So you're, you're sitting there in bed and you sniff the time. Well, you could taste it. Like, how about 
the clock of birds. This is the Kaluni people. Oh yes, now birds. this is lovely. The Kaluni people of Papua New Guinea, they have what they call the clock of birds. Um, and that certain birds, like the um, New Guinea firebird and the hooded butcherbird, when they sing in the mornings, the children are taught to understand that that's a signal to get up and leave and be able to get out of the house. When those birds sing their late afternoon calls, that's a signal to the children to go back home. The forest in the central islands of Papua New Guinea after dinner is a very, very um, difficult place to be in once it's dark, and that the children would need to know at what time to start heading for home. Yeah. 
demonstrate what Brian was talking about. We are now in the Central Park. We've got the area entirely roped off because we are going to demonstrate one of Einstein's famous thought experiments. All right. Which suggests that the subject, and if you will, I will be the subject, Jay, and I'll be the subject, must take a trip at an extraordinarily high speed. That's required here. So if you could help me by giving me whatever you've got. Uh, sure. Now here is a jetpack, turbocharged jetpack. Put it on back.
my mind picture the atoms and molecules and the interactions between them in the mostly empty space that's in there. And that when my hand touches the tabletop, I see the electrons in the outer surface of my hand pushing against the electrons in the outer surface of the table. I'm not really touching the table. My hand never comes into contact with the table. What's happening is the electrons are getting really close together and they're repelling each other. And I love the fact that I'm in essence deforming the surface of the table by making my electrons come really close to it. That enriches my experience. It doesn't. Do you help. share this with others? Uh, rarely. <laughs> uh. <laughs> You're listening to Major on New York Public Radio. Public Radio W and Time today, here with me to help you do that. It's Robert Crowich, ABC News, and um, 